Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Gianni Cessel, and uh, I am a volunteer of the IET Barcelona Local Network. Here you are at a webinar organized by the IET. Um, let's wait a little bit in order for people to uh, join in the webinar. Um, the attendees number are coming in and uh, increasing. When uh, we reach a decent number, then uh, we will start. Let's uh, wait a little bit. The counter is uh, counting. As soon as we reach a proper number, then uh, we'll start with uh, the Olympic Broadcasting Services, the technology behind the Olympic Games webinar. Let's um, wait for the 100 people attending the webinar and then uh, we'll start. Now we are close to it. Yes, here we go. We can uh, now start with uh, the Olympic Broadcasting Services, the technology behind the Olympic Games webinar. What uh, I'd like to do is to go through an introduction of uh, the overall webinar and the agenda. And then uh, we'll go towards the main corpus and presentation of uh, the webinar. So first, uh, let's move to the agenda. There is going to be a small introduction with uh, some explanation of uh, what is the IT. Then uh, a few words about uh, what is the IT here locally in Spain and the introduction to the speaker. Then, of course, there is going to be the Olympic Broadcasting Services, the technology behind the Olympic Games. This is the main presentation. And uh, once uh, uh, we have finished with it, there is going to be the possibility to do some question and answer. Please post your questions and uh, whatever are your reflections on the Q&A channels. You will see that the Zoom channel will provide two channels. One is the chat and the other one is the Q&A. Please post your questions to the Q&A so that then we read them and uh, our speaker will be able to uh, reply them. Again, with it, then uh, we will be close to the top of the hour and then we will close. Without further delay, what I'd like to do then is to start with the introduction. Commenting that the IET is one of the world's leading professional society for the engineering and technology community and provides global network knowledge. In Spain, we have about 200 members and it is part of the worldwide IET network. Here in Barcelona, the Barcelona Local Network organized this webinar to follow the spirit and the, the, of our institution to inform, inspire, and influence our community. Now, a few words about the speaker. Oh, sorry. First, why we wanted to organize this particular webinar. You know that uh, 2022 was the 30th anniversary for the 1992 Barcelona Olympic Games, and we thought to show what was uh, the games then and the technology then and uh, nowadays. Luckily, we have with us uh, Mr. Isidoro Moreno from uh, Olympic Broadcasting Services, Head of Engineering, who is going to be able to provide us some uh, view of uh, the technology to deliver pictures and sound and captivate billions of viewers worldwide. You will also understand how the technology has changed in the face of uh, Olympic broadcasting services and uh, in uh, these last three decades, how it evolved. A few notes about the speaker. Mr. Isidoro Moreno uh, started his OBS career in the Olympic Winter Games in Albertville in 1992. He previously worked as a technical director at Canal 24 TVE, this is the local Spanish uh, National Broadcasting Corporation. Then he was director at IBC's engineering for both the Athens 2004 and Turing 2006 host broadcasting organizations. This latter one um, earned him an Emmy of best coverage on sport event of high definition. Mr. Moreno directs the planning group 
responsible for the design and delivery of the technical facilities. He's also responsible for services um, of the host broadcasting operation of the Olympic Games. Mr. Moreno also oversees the international team of broadcast engineers and operation personnel, and they plan to the execute the technical strategy for the OBS activities. Without uh, much uh, delay, what I'd like to do is to ask Mr. Isidoro Moreno to start with his presentation on Olympic Broadcasting Services, the technology behind the Olympic Games. Um, Isidoro, now the stage is yours, and you can start with your presentation. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for having me here. So uh, I I will just explain briefly, which is the the evolution of the of the Olympic Games uh, in during the last thirty years, as Jani uh, was saying, for the anniversary of the Barcelona, nineteen ninety two. So uh, since the first time of the new era Olympic Games in 1896, uh, Pierre de Coubertin understood that the importance of the media uh, as a partner in order to globally promote the Olympic movement uh, in, in the world. No? And since this moment, and obviously based in the media itself, but also in the technology that you need in order to produce, produce the, the, the Olympic Games, uh, technology has been a, a, a very close and crucial element uh, in, in helping to make uh, Olympics uh, very comprehensive and, and just to do this global distribution and to extend and, and, and make available to everybody in every, in every corner of the world. So uh, since Barcelona 1992, because we are going to talk about this uh, 30 last years, uh, there were a lot of changes. Uh, I would say that, well, the evolution obviously from the beginning was uh, press, film, radio, etc. But in 1992, where inflection point in the way that the uh, games were perceived was the peak at the time in the audiences. And uh, was also a change where the dimension of the Olympic Games that normally were done by the major uh, broadcast uh, facility in the government of the country, the major broadcaster, this uh, the scope of the 1992 games was impossible to cover uh, in all sense for the amount of people needed for do the planning, the infrastructure need to to develop, etc. And no television could dedicate this uh, effort and just reducing for their own production. So it was the first time that the host broadcasting was a, one division of the organizing committee. So the host broadcaster has the uh, the rule to create the production of the, of, the, of the images and just to make available to all the media right holders, that is the way that we call the, the different uh, constituents of the global uh, the coverage of, uh, for media and uh, doing this production a comprehensive, but also viable. I mean, the amount of cameras that we use in Barcelona were over uh, 900. And that means that you cannot just place and overlay several broadcasters in the same um, broadcast uh, production. So we were doing a unique production, but we helped them to, to, to personalize. No? So this host broadcaster scheme that was this part of the local organizing committee of the games was maintained up to 2001 that uh, Olympic Broadcasting Services was approved by IOC and was the moment that the, the idea to have a, a, a permanent host broadcaster could be a good one. But still, there were some games to go that uh, the host broadcaster at, associated to the local organizing committee was maintained. And first time that uh, the full games were taken completely by OBS was in 2010 in, in, in Vancouver Games. So, uh, Olympic Broadcasting Services was created with the idea to create a permanent host broadcaster that allowed to have the neutral coverage because the, the way that we are covering cannot be polarized. We cannot cheer up more one country than the other one. We cannot uh, shoot more uh, at least from one country than the others. We are just focusing the competition itself, but also we are just trying to offer shots to every single media right holder of their own athletes. So this neutral coverage is a must that we have to follow. And there is a ethic behind that. We were uh, trying to be more efficient because one of the issues that were uh, was perceived in the in the past was that the transfer knowledge between different host broadcasters was not always uh, easy to do it, and just to have a core uh, team 
or a core company that is doing all consistent games is going to help to, to maintain this uh, level of uh, uh, quality, the level of standards of the coverage and the most, uh, most at the higher quality. So OBS is producing the international signal, which is the coverage of the different sports. We try to cover every single sport with the highest standard possible for Olympics. And I would say that most of the sports that we are covering, they have like a world, world championship of the sport level in the coverage or even bigger. No? So uh, it's a good opportunity to promote the games because we are keeping this high uh, level of, uh, of quality when it comes to, to cover the, the, the event itself. We are doing multiple uh, uh, formats. So we are just delivering, and we are talking about Barcelona. Barcelona was analog, obviously. But uh, since there, we were creating the different formats for the different platforms. You know, in the, at the time of Barcelona, we were doing mostly television and radio. But we have been evolving with these formats in order to adapt to the needs of the, of the different broadcasters. But obviously, to do a neutral coverage maybe could make that the individuals in their own country could miss the point or, or, the, or the interest. And because the media right holders, they are focused in different territories or areas of influence, they have better knowledge how they want to transmit and make it a co more co comprehensive the, the coverage that we are doing. So uh, this means that we are just providing them tools enough for them to, pro to personalize. So it doesn't matter that we have a full coverage with the higher standards. They can just place additional cameras that they can do their own interviews. They can place the additional TV studios or uh, any other uh, tool that they may need. We are trying to help them. And we have a directory of services working for them in order to, to, to help them to, to simplify and to make more efficient their own coverage itself. And one of these tools is the IBC, the International Broadcasting Center. No? The, this, this center is a, is a big building where we place all the technical facilities that the broadcasters they may need. When it comes to Barcelona, this was crucial because obviously the possibility to do a, a, a distribute or a, a deslocalized uh, coverage was much more difficult. Technology at the time was much more limited. And, and this was a operational center, very, very dense and very, very important for broadcasters in order to fulfill their, their productions. So OBS is a, is a core team of 160 Plus, we are around 163, if I'm not mistaken, with 30 different nationalities. So we are a very international uh, company. And we have an average of eight uh, Olympic Games, uh, like experience, each of us. We are based in Madrid. Our headquarters, uh, for several reasons, were uh, placed here. And, and, and it's a good uh, place to be in the sense that, well, we have very good communications. And I think that it's a city that could offer to us in a cost-efficient solution. Sometimes to place this uh, function somewhere else could be even more challenging from the economical standpoint. So what is the, the, the mission of OBS? The mission of OBS and games after games has been to try to do more and more to, to help the broadcasters and, and media in general for their own different platforms with doing more content. So that means that they can just pick and choose this content and repurpose for their own use, or even just sometimes we are giving to them ready to wear content that they can just simply uh, put as such. Uh, we are just giving additional footage, additional uh, interviews, and we are repurposing content in order to help them to, to post things in social media. We are trying to cover all the different aspects of the broadcasting. Uh, for this reason, we are having uh, regular meetings with the uh, media right holders. And we are discussing which is the way that we are going to do the coverage, uh, the way that we are going to deliver the content to them. So in order to be in the same, uh, uh, very well connected and very well synchronized with them in the way that we are going to deliver that. Uh, how we are doing less, I mean, IOC, International Olympic Committee has committed to try to reduce the impact of the Olympic Games being such a big event and just to reduce uh, when it comes to the broadcast, OBS to reduce footprint to reduce many, many things that we they are high demanding in order to simplify the, the, the responsibility of the local organizing committee to reduce the cost also and to make more efficient uh, coverage. So that means that uh, by reducing commentary positions because we are offering much more content that could be used remotely. 
uh, we are reducing also observer seats. Uh, the facilities that we are trying to use, they are advancing. So instead to use a huge or massive OB bands or, or even studios that we used to have in the, in the stadiums, we are just going to condense to be more efficient, more high quality, but mm, smaller in, in our footprint. And the same for the IBCs. The IBCs in the past, they were growing constantly, but we have reached a point that now we can offer same services that we were also offering on site remotely. So that means that they could be also placing and, and, and moving less technical facilities that allow to them to do exactly the same or even better because they are using their own permanent facility. And uh, one important element here is the power reduction by delocalizing the, the infrastructure that we are using for the games. That means that also we are having a, a big impact in the reduction of the power uh, uh, consumption. I have here a very small uh, workflow of the, of the way that we work. I will just briefly explain how uh, we are implementing this. So uh, in order to do the television coverage of, of games that we have is for one side, the venues where we have our technical facilities. There we place our cameras and our infrastructure microphones because for us audio is as important as video and we have our production unit normally located in the in the in the venue itself but this is changing as you will see later on when we continue and then we have our technical operation center which is an interface between the venue itself the different vendors because we don't own all the OV vans or the mobile units that we are using for the games we are adapting any OV van that we may need for a particular coverage and our adaptation point is this TOC. So we are using our own network to transmit to the IBC, the, the place that we were mentioning before, where the, mm, uh, the right holders, they have their technical facilities. So we have our technical distribution center, we receive the signals from the venue and we distribute to the broadcasters so they can repurpose their own uh, content. I mean, they are doing their, maybe their own programs they, with their studios, they have their own shows, they are editing uh, their own pieces, et cetera. And they are going back to our technical facilities in order to do the distribution. We have a big investment in transmission uh, for, for, for the games because this is the most important, and none of the most important because everything is important, but critical element here in order to make available anything that broadcasters are doing in the host city with connecting with themselves. So we have different, several manners to go, via satellite, via fiber optics in the network. We are just going through international points of presence. So hubs where we allowed broadcasters to go with their own partner in telecom partner, and they can go again by themselves by fiber, satellite, or now uh, cloud services. As I said before, one important personalization that uh, broadcasters are using are their own commentary. So commentary is logical that when you have just a transmission, we have a unique, let's say, production with uh, some additional cameras that the broadcaster they could do, but we have several commentators because they are doing the commentary in their own language. So again, this transmit to the IBC, which is our hub of operations. And from the IBC, we can just make the delivery to the broadcasters and from there to the world. This is in, 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 in a nutshell, the way that uh, the flow that we are using in, in Olympics. So the, the actual and very important element that we have as a host broadcaster is the storytelling of the games. It's very important that we are covering games in a way that is understood by all the spectators. No? The, 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 that uh, event like an Olympic with so many different sports that they are so different is sometimes different, difficult to know or to be an expert in them. But if you want to, and the way to promote these sports, you, make, you need to make it accessible to the spectators. So I have here a small video that is a, a timeline between Barcelona 1992 and Pyeongchang 2018. And I will have, uh, we will discuss later on about Tokyo and Beijing because I think that the, the changes that we have applied in Tokyo and Beijing and technology has allowed, has been uh, uh, to consider that they are linked for the future games. Sorry.
Okay, so these are things that they are representing a very important uh, inflection point no? from Barcelona till Pyeongchang. So Barcelona in 1992, as I explained before, was the first time that the host broadcaster was part of the local organizing committee due to the dimensions, but also all sports were uh, programmed and covered live. So this was also very important. There was in the past many uh, different disciplines that they couldn't be covered live and they were covered uh, through ENG. So autonomous cameras that they were repurposing the content and doing summaries. But in Barcelona first time was able to provide all the content that uh, all uh, during the sports and opening and closing ceremony was available. Uh, also, it was interesting point because we start with the parallel transmission of high definition analog at the time and was the entity vision 1250 that was a european consortium uh, with ebu and and different televisions also and they they were a number of 225 hours of live content so they were uh, events that they were covered live like a open ceremony athletics etc and also eng was the first time also that we used the digital recording system. Panasonic, that was top sponsor at the time, was providing the D5, was the video recorder that was doing a digital record in composite video. Cameras were CCD, so it was a big improvement in the way that was the, the, the setup of the cameras was very complex when we were using this kind of uh, very complex uh, tubes. And when it comes to the CCD, the simplification of that was uh, crucial and, and was very, very convenient for, for the project. No? And also we have a, a, a very interesting tool that was CIS, a commentary information system. So uh, commentators in the tribunes, they were able to, uh, uh, to, to access to live, real-time live uh, information about the, the the sports going on. So not all all be, or not all sports were covered in commentary with the commentary information system. This was later on in the time, but at the time it was a very easy way to have a computer with a touch screen that you could access to uh, how the event was happening and biographies of the of the athletes, etc. So it was uh, completely different that in the past everything was paper. So results were paper. You have to follow up with the score systems. So sometimes there are sports like a marathon that you cannot access to the field of play. So actually you are watching a TV and if you don't have real time information, it's difficult to, to know scoring, timing, etc. No? In the case of Atlanta was also uh, AOB Atlanta Olympic Broadcasting, the host broadcaster as part, as part of the OCOC. So this is keeping uh, consistently un until 2010, as we said before. But uh, a milestone that was in 1996 and was starting the, air, the internet era, was that the committee was the first time that created a web page and they have more than 150, 85 million visits. So it was uh, clearly a potential in internet in this case. Sydney, uh, the, the one important achievement was the graphics uh, package. As I said, storytelling is very important in games and the way that you tell stories uh, is uh, difficult if you don't have a visual uh, tool that is helping to you out. So graphics, we were just working very hard in the design of the icons and, and all the narratives from the graphics standpoint in order to make a packet that was consistent and was covering all the different scenario that you have in a, one sport and sometimes it's super complex, no? the, the, the amount of things that may happen. And also was an interesting moment because nine productions were done from the IBC. Obviously it was from the Olympic Park, in the Olympic Park in Sydney, there were a number of venues that they were together, uh, opening ceremony, basketball, etc. And then we start running cables from the venue to the IBC and the production was done centralized in the, in the IBC itself. It was an interesting, interesting experiment and early, I would say, so the adoption was taking some time in order to, to be fully implemented. 2002, that was the Salt Lake City Games, the Winter Olympic Games, was the first time also that the whole competition was covered live for a Winter Games. So it took a little bit longer than the, the Summer Games. So 2004 was Athens, uh, AOB, Athens Olympic Broadcasting, not, not, to, not to be confused with Atlanta, the same name, but or same acronym, but different name. Uh, all coverage was dig digital. So in Barcelona, as I said, the, the, the standard that we were using was a standard definition. We did some HD uh, coverage, high, high definition coverage in parallel, and it was kept. I mean, in the, in the coming games, 
still where some high definition coverage done in parallel, but it was different, uh, was separate. So that means that the, 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 the narratives that you have in high def were not exactly the same that we have in standard definition. So that means that in order to cover properly the high def transmission that they were mostly a test, they were done by different commentators because obviously you have a replay that maybe they are not coincident the replay in both uh, productions. So uh, in Athens, we did a significant amount of uh, high definition content. This was pro, uh, designed by ourselves in the past was like a partnership with uh, other constituents, but in, in Athens was done directly by the host broadcaster. And also the whole, the whole coverage was digital. So Barcelona fully analog, Sydney, we were like a 60% analog, 40% digital. Salt Lake City was the opposite, 40% uh, analog, 60% digital, and Athens first time digital everything. Obviously, the dimension of a summer games is bigger than the winter, so was a big effort down there. And as I said before, since internet was taking a prominent uh, in the in the games, broadcasters and broadcasters were doing streaming of the of the events uh, via internet. 2006 is a very interesting point. Also, was Winter Games was also the, the TOBO as part of the host broadcasting and as part of the local organizing committee. And it's a very interesting inflection point in the sense of the video record. So the host broadcaster is producing all the feeds for the, for the media right holders, but he's also doing a very important role, which is to archive, to do the archive. This archive, obviously, when in the time of the tapes was a very, uh, but it was a bit bottleneck because you have to record the tape. You cannot start doing editing up to the moment that you don't finish the tape. And all of a sudden we implement this video server that few broadcasters were using the service, but obviously was much more agile to access to the content 15 seconds after you started with the, with the, with the record. BOV in, in Beijing was the first time that we were doing a transition to full HD. So everything was produ produced in HD, 5.1 surround. And from there, we were just doing the different uh, formats for the different uh, uh, services that we were providing. So we were doing this delivery of the Banda package at the time in SDI, uh, HD SDI, but we were doing also a, a compressed version that we call IP Banda, that was the 40 feeds that we produce, ready to be uh, in different uh, bit rates. So this was ready to be used by broadcasters in different platforms. We start also with the Olympic News Channel that was a platform doing news bulletins of 30 minutes, every 30 minutes. So broadcasters, they have stories available, they are ready to air again that they could use. And we start also with the copyright infringement uh, program that was uh, doing fingerprints of all the live production that we were doing. So we made available this database to the broadcasters. And in case that uh, someone was using uh, without the rights, the content could be identified. And finally, 2010, uh, we have here Vancouver. That was the, the first time that OBS act as a full host broadcaster. And we introduced a new digital commentary system and the multilateral distribution service that was uh, a small set of four feeds out of the 20 that we generate in the in the Banda package. That was a compilation of the uh, finals and semifinals that we made available, fully produced for, uh, for transmission to the broadcasters. And then moving on, uh, we have uh, 2012 London. We did in partnership 8K with NHK and BBC. We did also a coverage in 3D. And we use a additional a, a, a slow motion system, extra high speed slow motion system that they were capable to take between 600 and 1000 frames. And obviously the replays were becoming a new, a new way to, of definition. In Sochi, we start with our, our OTT platform and we start using drones for first time in a snowboard and freestyle skiing competitions. And in the, in the case of Rio, in 2016, we have the, uh, established an international transmission, so we start just doing more distribution. So we start just try, really try to extend the content that we produce locally in the, in the venue itself to make available also in the, in the broadcaster's uh, headquarters. This was a significant change again because it was a new a way to distribute content and to make a, a broadcaster's uh, uh, able to use their own facilities back home. 
We continue with the 8K, but this time we were doing HDR, so high, high dynamic range, meaning better quality picture than before. I mean, more picture, but better quality again. And we start with a virtual reality service with Live 360, so offering like a new ways to, to, to offer content to the broadcaster for them to repurpose. And we start also as part of our sustainability project with the prefab modular system. So the IBC, the, the fit out that we call, which is the partitioning that the broadcaster may need for their own offices, they are doing a request of this uh, partitioning and we are uh, doing the, the installation. So instead to use systems that they were just to build and to demolish, that we were trying to do was to, to be more sustainable by pre creating prefabricated, pre prefabricated modules that we put in place was a very dusty clean uh, free dust uh, environment, very, very well perceived. But also once that we finish the game, we recover and we move to the next operation. And in 2018, we start with the cloud services. So archive that in the past was available as a centralized and, and a very uh, collaborative tool, as we said in Torino, this was placed, <clears throat> the sole fourth com content was placed in the, sorry, was placed in the cloud. So broadcasters around the globe, they could access to this content uh, wherever they were. And in order to fulfill this accessibility, we implemented an international connectivity that was 400 uh, gigabits uh, per second. So this was a huge uh, connectivity capacity. So as I said before, we have a separated uh, Tokyo and Beijing because they are a, a, a way that as we stay today and is a, the road to map for the future. There's some good technology. It's like watching a, a science fiction film. We live in times which are incredibly exciting in terms of technological innovation. And in that, we see ourselves a huge opportunity to use this innovation in telling these stories in different ways. One of the best things about working the Olympics is all the cool toys we get. VR, POVs that show you cool perspectives and super high speed motion and slow motion effects. It's beautiful and I, I really enjoy that part of it. I see a lot of people try VR for the first time at these games. People have been quite wowed by the difference in quality. This is the first time on the broadcast event that we are outputting an 8K signal. People love to go down on the slope style or the big air. You have the possibility to immerse yourself in the atmosphere of the live event. With 8K now, really, you start being in a position that uh, this world around you feels like the real world. UHD is a much, much higher resolution uh, image. HDR is a higher dynamic range. It looks very much more for if you were there. And to be able to go into our video quality control area and see these images for the first time was really a defining moment for me. We've got two immersive mics, so they're eight capsules. We're trying to get a sound that if you were watching a sport and you closed your eyes, you would still know what sport it was. So we're going for the detail in the sport. What is the athlete moment? This is the way that we can connect athletes to their families at home that weren't able to come to the Olympic Games. I think they really do appreciate it. I love you. Well, as of a few years now, we took an initiative which has technology at its heart, but has to do a lot with sustainability. We started what we call the OBS Cloud, which is a custom-made broadcast platform. It really provides an opportunity to our broadcasters to do many more things remotely without undermining at all the reliability and the quality of what they do. The benefits are very, very clear. All this content, all this amount of uh, hours that we're producing throughout the games, are all transferred to the cloud through our internet access. And this um, huge amount of bandwidth that we use was probably surpassing the bandwidth use of internet in uh, major cities around the world. Now, let me show you the future. What you see here is the obi -Van of the future. We hope to use this system in Paris and beyond. When planning for obi -Vans or flight packs, we basically face three main challenges. Footprint, functionality, 
and of course logistics. These three key factors have been addressed with this project. The result we see is of the same quality that we have in our normal post coverage. One of the things that we're implementing in this IBC is the centralized technical areas. The solution has been a new beginning. We've managed to be a lot more efficient in our requirements. This is something that we plan to continue improving for the coming games along the sustainability path that we want to follow. We've created this platform, Content Plus, which is our way of delivering content to the rights holders in a kind of really easy to find, easy to download way. There is uh, the expectation that uh, we are one step ahead of the rest of the industry. And nobody would be happy to just have the Olympic Games with exactly the same technological setup that it was before. They want to see innovation, they want to see new things. The importance of that is to make sure that we maintain a very high quality of coverage for the games. So these are different ways to which we use technology to tell the stories of the athletes. Okay, so the main things that we have seen here has been UHD HDR and immersive audio. Uh, this is the way to, to show in more realistic way, close to the eye resolution. Uh, as uh, we mentioned here, 4K is close to the high resolution, 8K is exactly the same that high resolution. So you have the feeling that you are watching something that is real more than really, you are just watching things as you were in a window watching uh, the event. <clears throat> so we did this change because uh, we start doing parallel production as we did before with HD, between HD and UHD, but we, uh, broadcasters, they were claiming to have a single production and then was a really big effect and big effort and, and, and difficult because it was during the pandemic situation uh, that we moved to UHD and as a maximum high level of resolution, to start from there to do the different flavors for the different platforms and different uh, services that we were providing. So the production was kept with the highest possible resolution. Still the video server we were using, not uh, UHD, we were using uh, HD, no? that is our standard at, uh, for the time being. So we base ourselves in the OBS cloud, uh, many services that in the past were uh, almost impossible to, to achieve. So in Tokyo we have this Content Plus platform that we were mentioning before that was at the beginning only short form video clips, we put everything. So the 9,000 plus hours that we produce in, in Tokyo were fully available in the, in the cloud service and broadcasters ready to access in, instantly. So the, the improvement is, is great. I mean, instead to go for a local machine that you have to search in the server and then push to your country, content was in the different regions in the world. So it was a, 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 out of a click to find out your, your content and just to start doing a work with that. We start also with the first uh, experiments with 5G. We start doing some uh, switching between the RF uh, systems to 5G systems that they are more much more easier for us because you know right, uh, radio frequency uh, is quite, quite robust, but the problem is that you have to register frequencies, you have to find out the spectrum, more and more is more difficult. So a 5G could be helpful in order to simplify our wireless operation. And we start also with experimentation of artificial intelligence. So ways to define automatically within the picture the, the, the content and to describe that. And we're just merging not only the feature analysis, but also the metadata that we have around the around the Olympics. So this is very important and helping us to, to find out the actual content that we are looking for. So we start bumping up the, the number of hours that we were uh, recording So uh, and, and just making available in different formats, as I said before. So we have just like a fully UHD content. We have HD content for everything. With that, we did have different uh, versions of the same uh, content in order to have uh, to fulfill different platforms, like OTTs, etc. Uh, we were making uh, available also different shots. We created uh, one thing that is called a multi clips feed. That in parallel to the transmission, we are just taking from different angles or different cameras different footage that we made available to the media right holders, so they can just make more com comprehensive the the way that the that the event is happening. No? As we said, once again, the storytelling is super important and, and this gives the opportunity to personalize even the way that you are telling the, 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 that what is happening in, in the Olympics. 
And then we include the new ways to uh, help athletes, because in the case of Tokyo and Beijing, we were in isolation. We didn't have spectators in the venues and it was very difficult for athletes to perform the same. We know that it's not the same to perform in front of the audience that is cheering up you. So we offered to them a, a fun a engagement project that was a, covering uh, the possibility to people remotely uh, just cheer up their favorite athletes to do a small clips and just to post it. Or even after they perform uh, one uh, in one event, they could have la a video conference with their friends, family, etc. So this was also important and very well perceived that we were using both Tokyo and Beijing. Uh, in the video, someone has mentioned the centralized technical areas, the, our construction director. And the, this is a, a new uh, way to make more efficiencies. So in the past, we were having a huge building with in every corner, we should be able to deliver power and air conditioning in order to cool down the, the equipment and just to keep comfortable people. Then we, and technology allows with the digital uh, platforms now and the IP world to, to do a data center type of a technical area. So we create like a, few spots within the IBC where we place additional power, additional air conditioning, so we can serve better for the for the machinery to be uh, in a good conditions. And that means a reduction also in the infrastructure that has to be applied, because in this case, we know which are the, the ducting system that we have in order to supplement a huge amount of air. And, and, and the office space were obviously lighter in these requirements. So this was super important. Remote operations has helped us to, to do reduction also in the in the footprints. So the IBCs, they are not bigger anymore. They are keeping reductions and they are keeping reducing because now many things that they in the past were obliged to be done locally now could be done back in your premises with the comfort that you have the people that they know how it works. You have the existing infrastructure that you can reutilize and just to make more efficient. So there are a lot of benefits there. And also we start with, we, we continue with this modular system that we are making more modern and more efficient uh, in, our, in our operations. So there are a few minutes to go. So which is the future of the Olympic broadcasting? Okay, the, the future is very linked for us in the things that we are doing now with uh, what we were doing in Beijing and Tokyo, but we are keeping evolving. No? And for us, uh, it's very important that we are adopting the latest technology. The latest technology normally help us to make things in a more efficient way, uh, cheaper, uh, and, and to provide more added value to, to our uh, media right holders. Uh, we were talking about the Virtual of Ivan. Virtual of Ivan is a project that we were uh, experimenting in Beijing and was, was going quite fine. And we are exploring the possibility to use in the future, which is instead to have a big track that is uh, completely customized for uh, one function and has a lot of elements that maybe they are used because the uh, Ovivan is a multi-purpose uh, unit. So they can do the same a concert that they could do a uh, event, a sports event that they can do a TV show. Obviously they have different needs for the different coverage that they are doing. To do this virtual Ovivan could be to base in a standardized hardware and to place in particular software that is uh, adequate to, to really uh, tailor it, the production that we need, and really to avoid a very important element, which is the logistics. Olympics are happening in 17 days, and that means a big effort in money and, and logistics to move a number of trunks, tracks around the world, because not uh, in the case, for instance, of Tokyo, that we were doing everything UHD, you don't have enough of events capable to take the, the, the production of the Olympics in a single country, so we need to start moving uh, uh, Obivans from the all the all, all the world. OBS owns and is very important also as a the core system, the core hardware, and we are repurposing for every games, adapting, improving here in Madrid. So, but we are keeping this core system uh, as minimal as possible. But obviously, we this help us to customize and to make uh, things very efficient. No Olympics, they are not exactly the same that the regular television or a regular broadcast facility. So this customization is required every time that we are doing uh, games and we adapt to the particular games. And another thing that we do is uh, 
very rapidly migration to the new technologies as uh, we are adopting them. It's very important for us to be ready. And that means a big effort also in the people that is working in OBS to be up to date in the new technologies that we can uh, use for the different uh, events. So for the future, we are expecting to have better narration. As we said, storytelling is key here. There is no point to do only technology by technology or just do things that they don't make any sense. We have to make a sense out of the production that we are doing. And this is a, the, the key element that is making the Olympics attractive for the spectators because they understand, for the broadcasters because they have big audiences and for everybody because we are promoting the, the sports and the athletes. So it's, it's, a, it's a conjunction of the, the all elements. no? And obviously new technology, we are just trying to use a virtual reality, artificial intelligence, anything that is in our hand in order to, to enhance and to make more efficient and more easy the personalization for the broadcasters and the production of the, of the feeds for them. So just like a, the back end that we are doing is, as we said, cloud ad adoption. So today we have these CTAs but the city is probably also with the evolution of the cloud services and the power uh, of these uh, uh, different uh, providers. Many of the equipment that is now located in the IBC could be also moved to the, to, the, to the cloud. In order to be able to do that, it's very important that we are doing a transition to the IP worlds. So in the past, just to have the footprint that we have now to do things uh, was much bigger because you have to use particular hardware that could do only one thing. Cloud in a way means like you have a computer that you can run today a word processor or tomorrow spreadsheet, or you can do tomorrow a retouching a digital content. Cloud is the same. So cloud could be today, a server could be a vision, a vision mixer, tomorrow could be an audio mixer, or, or the day after tomorrow could be a controller, a CCU from a from a, from a camera. So that means that we are dematerializing the infrastructure and we are doing more based in the software and a standard hardware. And this simplify a lot. So looking ahead, we are keeping uh, producing UHC and 8K, we are planning to do that. We are planning to have our uh, over the top uh, platform. Virtual reality is in our, in our hand also, 5G, as we said before is the way to go in the wireless transmissions is going to offer to us many other possibilities. Things like uh, in the past were impossible when you were recording with an autonomous camera now could be connected worldwide and not only worldwide, but a high speed and high quality. So the same standard that you are producing in studio, every time is going to be closer and closer to the, to the uh, autonomous production. And here I have a map of the connectivity that we are offering. No? So for one side, we go from the venues to the ABC with our... So we go from the venue to the ABC. Now more and more, and through the, this IP transformation, we go to the IBC and the world. And we are using, uh, using fiber or any means that we may have, having more content, more audios inside, different uh, formats, etc. And the way that we go is to use also cloud for that. So, and this in a nutshell is the, the presentation. So we try to be agnostic. Yeah. Thank sorry. you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was uh, very interesting. And uh, just because of it, so what uh, I'd like to do is start with uh, the question and answer. Therefore, what I'll do is I share just a generic screen for it. Let me see if I can make it quickly. Let okay. me know whether you can see uh, the overall yes. Yes, yes. question and answer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Basically, I'd like um, people who have uh, questions to post them in the Q&A too, but I will start with those which are already posted. So I'll go with the first one. Mm -hmm. This one says, how do you plan to the infrastructure and cabling for the games, given how the technologies advances so much from one game to the next. So the planning of the infrastructure in a four year period, is it something that you do it say yeah. comfortably? So as, 
Yeah, as part of the planning, this uh, cabling is super important because we have like uh, three categories of plane, of uh, cabling, no, I would say. One category is the cabling that we need to do in the venue itself in order to put the broadcast, the pure broadcast infrastructure. So that means that we have to place a production unit that is placed locally in the venue with the cable for the cameras, cables for the for the microphones, wireless elements that they are going to be cable also in the CCUs, etc. So this is part of the planning project and that's why it's taking so long because we are doing, I, I didn't say, but we are just making coincident up to four games now, being the single, single team in the past where every committee has their own host broadcaster. Now we are just the same. So that means for us, uh, it's helping us because we know exactly which is more the expectations and we can just do a very good planning. So we are doing the planning for the for the production itself, camera, cable cameras, uh, et cetera, that we are going and moving more and more in fiber because fiber is allowing in a single strand to place multiple uh, signals. Meanwhile, in the past, every signal was requiring a single cable. No? Now this is much more efficient. So this is one of the cabling. The other cabling that we have is the, the transmission between the venue and the IBC. This is quite important and it's a significant effort also, but the biggest one in a single venue is the IBC itself. So the IBC, and we move from copper long away, so we are not using copper, or we are minimizing the use of copper to the minimum, and we are distribution through like a hubs that we have inside the IBC and fiber. So we reduce close to a, a 70% in the number of uh, the cables that we have to run. And in the past, I remember in Athens, for instance, we have in the IBC, uh, the, the CDU, that is our contribution, uh, our technical area, our master control, like a 3,800 cables. Now you have, uh, you have only a few, eh? less okay. than 100. Thank you very much. This was a quite exhaustive answer. And I think that uh, many people enjoyed your uh, technical information. I'm going with the second one. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to read it. Always admire, I always admire the quality of broadcasting. Will there come a time when the judging of the sports relies on images to produce? So the judges, are they now, uh, they are not looking at the images produced by your systems in order to judge the events, the sports events? Will there come a time when they will be doing that? Uh, may happens. Uh, the reality is that the judges, as part of the athletes, I think that is part of their feast. No? I mean, the Olympics is their, 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 is their event. So we have to be uh, very careful in the way that we are just doing these kind of efficiencies because maybe we are losing the purpose, no? But I don't say that it's not going to happen. But the reality is that the judges, they are using technology, television technology by themselves. So when they are just doing the bar, not that everybody knows now, which is the, the review of the action, they have particular cameras. Sometimes they are using our cameras in order to do so. Sometimes they are using additional overlay of cameras that they are much more specific. So uh, sports are becoming like a high tech uh, event and there are plenty of new things that they are really amazing. No, like a, for instance, wearables where athletes, they are wearing things that allows to have a, the feeling of the of the athletes in many, many aspects. Like a, we have seen in the videos, uh, people with a POV cameras or point of view cameras in the top of the, he the, the helmet that they are giving also information to the, to the judges. But the judges, they are using video audiovisuals in order to do the evaluations because they are doing more and more in every single sport, not in all, but in most of them. Thank you. Uh, let's go with uh, another uh, question. The Olympic Games drives innovation in the live sport broadcasting around the globe. Which technology do you think is uh, the one, uh, do you, which technology do you think has had the biggest influence in the global, global community of live sports production? So well, which one of the technology has had the greatest uh, influence? In, ev in every period, I think that has been uh, something that is more significant, no? Uh, I was watching here because we have an exhibition area here in the office where you can see, for instance, resolution is very important because in the in past games where, where standard definition, even you couldn't distinguish when they have the zoom in, that with high definition, ultra high definition, definition, you can see details. The most important achievement we have done is lately, because with the COVID, I think without the possibility to transmit signals all over the globe without moving, was 
probably impossible. So I would say that it, uh, the COVID happens, happens like, a, I don't know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, probably we should cancel. So we, we postpone, I think, for the safety people, not because of the technology didn't allow it. So in do the same transmission remotely. But the problem we, uh, for the safety of the people, I think that was the major uh, element in order to, to move or to delay the, the games. And that's why Tokyo and Beijing are probably, but I would say Tokyo and Beijing because they are very coincident. We start with these cloud services and with this worldwide networking and help us to, to, to make happen the event. Not only us, I mean, big events. I'm not talking about only Olympics. Eh? I'm talking generally speaking about the big events. Fantastic. Thank you. Let's go to the next one. And here, um, what uh, uh, the uh, person asks is, what are the data storage and data transmission involved? Some concrete numbers during the after, uh, during and after the event. So you mentioned that there are different stages. Mm -hmm. And what type of capacity do you use among these stages? And what well, storage capacity do you use in I between mean them? If you are talking about the bandwidth, for instance, which is quite impressive element in Tokyo, we have like a 1.7 terabytes connectivity, international connectivity. I was talking in, in, in Pyeongchang for 400 gigabits, but in Tokyo we have 1.7. So it was a huge storage space. We have several petabytes, like a 2.5 petabytes in order to record all the hours that we were just uh, producing. So the numbers are among us, but if you are counting, but thanks God, this technology is available today. So we were able to make it. Uh, and as I said, uh, these collaborative uh, ideas that we are applying today with the, this webinar, no? that we are able to be whoever, wherever in the world, we can just do these kind of things thanks to this uh, technology that allowed uh, to do the connection worldwide. Fantastic. It is impressive. All these numbers are really impressive, as I said earlier. Let's go to the next one. Hi, Isidoro. A couple of questions to reframe the frame rate. One, what frame rate is used? 50 or 60? And it depends. For the acquisition. Okay. Well, this is this is a very good question, actually. So we try to be uh, as less impacting as possible. So the standard that we adopt is based in the country standard. So when we moved to, for instance, we were in Tokyo, in Tokyo, the frequency was 50 Hertz. In some places were 59.94. So because there was this merging, we go, went to a standard 50 Hertz. But for instance, in, 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 in other places like uh, Korea, we were 59.94. When we were in Barcelona, we were 50. When we are in States, we are going to be 59.94. So normally we adopt the standard of the country to simplify the whole thing. And also because it's helping the broadcasters that they are on site to find out the easiest way to work around the, the facilities that they could use for a short period of time. So they can rent elements there that they are compliant with this power frequency and also the television frequency. So we have the tendency to try to minimize impact and whenever possible, we adapt, adopt that in the, in the country. Excellent. And the second part to this question was, in the future, do you see a higher frame rate like 100 frames per seconds to be used? Well, that I see really is that in the digital world and in the IP world, when the people is connecting to this uh, UGC platform, no, like uh, YouTube, etc., you really don't care about which is the frame rate. You have a device that is capable to reproduce. So I see the future like a standardization in this equipment that is going to be multi-standard and then you can just connect and you don't care really if it's 50, 60, whatever. This is for the, let's say, for the for the, for the play out or reproduction of the of the content. For the, for the capture of the content, we should go for the highest frame possible in order to have the highest resolution possible. There are limitations because, for, uh, for instance, in the case of 8, 8K, the physical limitation because of the speed of light, we are talking about 120 frames per second. So if we want to do like a super slow motion, probably we need to go for different ways, like a artificial intelligence that is creating the intra frames or things like that. That could help, and this moment is the is the way that to go and to help that. Thank you very much. Um, I think what we have is uh, so many more questions. Unfortunately, we are close to the top of the hour, and I would like to ask you the last one, which okay. is my own question. Okay. And here is perhaps uh, something that I haven't heard from you because 
I wonder whether the Olympic Broadcasting Corporation thinks to post, say, all the Olympic Games images into the meta world. Is this something you are considering or not? Well, we are considering any single possibility. So this is clearly something that is not out of the, of the our radar, and, and we have to be very vigilant. And, and, and the reason of that, uh, we have cases like, a, for instance, a 3D in London. We were doing coverage in 3D London that finally didn't really, 3D didn't went so much in the live sports coverage, no? And I think that was a, probably was a wrong timing, no? So meta, meta is something similar. I see, I see that is something that is, uh, could, could have a very good potential, but uh, we need to really to discuss with the broadcasters and just to agree in the way that if they have the interest, as it was a case in London, we can try to do and produce something that is in, in conjunction with them, so in partnership. So we are open to anything. We try to, to really to, our mission here is to promote Olympic Games, Olympic Charter and athletes, and, and the effort that the athletes they are doing in order to come to, 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 to achieve these records, this is very important. And any is helping to further develop, we are open. Okay, thank you very much. I think that now we have to uh, go to, towards the closure. Thank you a lot, uh, Isidoro, for this presentation. Now what I'd like to do is to progress towards the closure of uh, this event. Um, here, um, everyone has uh, my information, that is to say the email address, if they want to address me with uh, other questions or queries they have. There is also the link to download the CPD certificate. This counts towards your um, professional uh, development. And uh, again, what I'd like to do is to uh, give you uh, the best wishes for uh, this day. I hope you liked the presentation, you liked this type of uh, events, and I really hope to see you again in uh, IET events in this house. Thank you very much. Have a good day. See you soon and bye-bye. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye.